Hi, John. How are you? Good, thanks. Sorry, I had a little uh, stuff keeping me from signing on quicker there. A couple things popping up. That's fine. So, um, first up is the election of officers. I'm happy to continue chairing if you would like me to do that. Um, I'm good. Scott? I, I want to nominate Dan Riss to chair the Community Preservation Act Committee for this yes, I'll Are second. you sure he's qualified? All right. I, I feel very confident in his leadership for the following term. Any other nominations? Hearing none, uh, Jamie, can we have a vote, please, of the members who are here? Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, Andy is absent. Dan. Yes. Uh, Greg is not here yet. Uh, Jay. Hi. Jessica. Hi. Uh, Joe is not here yet. Uh, John. Hi. And Harry. Hi. And Scott. Hi. All right. So that's six in, six in favor with three absent. Vice Chair Scott, do you want to keep doing it? I, I nominate, nominate Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Suck it. <laughs> uh okay uh, hiring any other nominations no okay so uh may we have a vote for the vice chair please all right um dan yes yeah uh, jay aye jessica aye john aye harry aye and scott Hi, and I, I just want to thank the committee for that ringing endorsement of the one meeting I ran that lasted like 20 minutes because nothing was on the agenda. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate your support. I promise to you that if I'm going to miss a meeting, it'll be a short meeting that you have to take care of. Yeah, well, you did that. You followed that promise last year. So thank you, Dan. I'll try not to miss meetings. <laughs> uh, approval of the minutes of 12-16-21. Nicely done. May I have a, uh, a motion, please? Uh, motion to approve the minutes from 1216. Uh, uh, somebody second. <laughs> you guys should stay off of mute. So somebody second the motion, please. Second the motion. Second. Okay. We have a motion to accept the minutes of December 16th. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Jamie. Let's try with Scott. No, well, he said I can read lips. Sorry. <laughs> Harry. Hi. Jessica. Hi. John. Hi. Jay. Hi. And Dan. Hi. All right. So motion passes six in favor with three absent. I assume uh, Elizabeth Marge, Laurie, you're here for the library, but if there's a, if, if you want to do public speak other than the library, now's the time. No. Okay. Any uh, communications for city officials, Jamie? Um. So the just heard from um, Stuart Saginar from the state CPA coalition that the ten million dollars that was an additional uh, for the CPA state match will be um, being distributed will be distributed to uh, communities soon. I did not have a chance yet to uh, look into it to see what the total is that we're getting for this uh, fourth for the for the additional funding. Um, but previously, we were at about seventy percent match from the 20, 2020, uh, sorry, the FY twenty twenty one. So um, this should bring that up a little bit higher. It hasn't been that high since it was 100% way back in the beginning of this, so this is fantastic. Let's not run out and spend it too fast. Um, we have, Jamie and I were discussing, we have approximately $1.4 million in the bank, 1.2 in undesignated and 100,000 in housing and 100,000 in historic. Was that the other one, Jamie? Correct. Um, so that's that's good news. So the account balances and project updates, we can go over those next time. I'd like to see an updated list for the next meeting, please. Yeah, 
I'll work on work, work with Hadel to get an updated list for the committee for the February meeting. Emily Williston Library. Um, we have an application for fifteen thousand dollars. I we are the ones who asked for that, and I'm very happy to see it come to this point. Um, Jamie, do you want to start us on that, and then any of our Elizabeth, anybody else from the library want to say anything? But of course, we want this to happen. I assume, Jamie, this is for legal fees, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's um, for the the legal costs, um, any appraisals that would need to be done in order to figure out what the value of that restriction would be. Um, it would also include um, sort of any miscellaneous um, items that would come up. Um, if we get to the point of filing this um, or, or putting it, it would include filing fees at the Registry of Deeds. Um, but it doesn't, it's, it's everything except for what the value of the restriction would be. So if, if there is a desire to fund that the value of the restriction, then, then that would have to be, come back to the CPA for a, or a different funding body for another appropriation. So once this is done, it goes to the state and, and we get this historic designation once that's established. We do all the paperwork, et cetera, we get historic designation. Is that how it works? Well, it's not, it's not a historic designation. It's a, it's a preservation restriction that's filed. Oh, okay. it's, it's, it's attached to the, the property deed. Um, and it would, it's a three-party agreement. So it's the uh, property owner, the Mass Historic Commission, and whichever entity is going to actually hold the restriction. So that could be the City of East Hampton's Historical Commission. Uh, it could be the City Council. Um, it could be uh, a historical society or another nonprofit that's um, in the business of holding preservation restrictions or historic preservation restrictions. So, so John, is this uh, under your his, historic uh, committee? Has this already, has the library already been designated locally? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's in the inventory. Okay, so I imagine it would be great. This is a, the city doesn't own this building. So either um, the historic committee holds this preservation or somebody does locally. If the historic committee is appointed by the city, then that has some jurisdiction, I believe. But I'll, I'll, I'm going to ask that the lawyers uh, firm up who should hold this preservation, whether it's in the city clerk's office or historic commission. Yeah. yeah it, it, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say it, it's um, it's really just a question of who who wants to be the enforcement agency of the restriction. So there are some um, requirements to monitor a restriction. So um, there would be a you know, an annual or review to make sure that the building hasn't been altered um, past the point of it, like negating the restriction. Um, All right, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth. You promised not to alter the building. <laughs> <laughs> I promise not to alter the building. Um, in yes, uh, other than any uh, updates that I mean, you know things that we have to do to keep it from further, uh, you know, falling apart for lack of better words. But um, it, it, what was a discussion uh, at the board and the, the corporators meeting, and we all came to a unanimous, you know, decision to, to move forward with this, was the talk of, you know, if we sell, um, you know, when we move, um, you know, what's going to happen. And, um, that was the only only question that we had, and I think that it wasn't enough of an issue to stop us from really wanting to move forward to to you know to follow through with the whole process uh, because we just think it's extremely important, and we're really thrilled that that you've brought this to us. And um, well, remember the reason we did so, CPA yes. committee 
wants to make sure that if we invest in further projects yes. into the library, that the building is preserved historically. Exactly. So once you get this historic preservation, it's a lot easier yep. to request CPA funds for anything. And then we'll make sure that historically the building's architecture is preserved. Yeah, that's but wonderful because we don't know when we're going to be moving. So, you know, I'm sure that there I hope it's if you're going to be moving. <laughs> but I just like that to stay a library of some kind. But that's just me. Um, well, we so have ideas, you know, going forward. And, and I and I you're probably not the only one. And there's part of me, too, that, you know, as a little girl used to to uh, hang out there. So um, I, I share your your sentiment. But um, so I think that that's Marge. Do you have anything that you want to, to add or ask? Um, Dan and the committee, I think what you need to understand is that we love the building, but we also know the amount that we need to put into the building takes away from programming, takes away from the community in general. That at some point, we will need a big space. We did a building assessment, and honestly, we are in a building a third of the size of what our community could be using and utilizing. So we understand that. But that is also part of the history of East Tampa. And it's a beautiful little building. Before we did the repair on the basement, nobody had done anything since 1960. That's too long for an old building to sit without one or two things being done. And we know that. So we have to preserve what we've got and make it usable, what it will be used for. There is just so many different ideas, but I can't see the city turning it away. I can't see the community saying, okay, we've got to close these doors. The imagination will come. We will not lose that building. But honestly, for our purposes, we can't park around it. It's just, there, there's just so much. So there's a give and take. And I appreciate the opportunity to work and investigate this. Is this the right path for us? Um, and working with your committee is going to be very good. Um, just so you know, we do have Dave Ingram with us. He didn't change his name from Lori. <laughs> um, so it'll be Dave, Caitlin, and I that are going to kind of be working with you guys. And Elizabeth is there cheering us on. Um, okay. I don't want anyone to think that we're trying to get the money and then sell the building and fly. There's just too much history, and we love it. We just need to help it. Well, let me just say that I'd like, if you have any maintenance issues on this building moving forward, the fact that it's historically preserved gives us gives you a lot easier access to CPA funds. I'm going to ask uh, committee members if they have questions, and I see Jessica's hand up. Jessica. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think um, what's just important to remember is that with a restriction, no matter who is the end user of this building, whether it's the library or whether it's another community group that takes the building over, if they come to the CPA, that restriction will always be in place. So, yes. you know, it doesn't have to just, it doesn't have to be the library. The whole point is that it runs with the deed. So whoever is the owner right. has to abide by that restriction. And if they right. want to do any modifications to that building or need assistance with that building, they can come to the CPA and that restriction will be in place. So, um, you know, just a point of clarification on that end user and, and how that restriction is kind of going to work with it. Thank you, Jess. That's, that is exactly what we're looking for. Any other members before I get to you, Marge? Yes. Uh, Marge. I, you know, that is, to me, a really good selling point to anybody that might want to utilize the building or take it over for us, that they aren't getting a big old building with a lot of issues. They're getting a building with support. So again, I think working with the CPA in the long run is going to help the building that we want to preserve that's been around for 180 years. Okay. Anybody else? Uh... I see the Montague Library Director is here. <laughs> I'm wondering. That's Miss Caitlin. <laughs> Sorry, I just came from back to back other library meetings and <laughs> didn't get a chance to change it. 
I live in East. Andy and, Andy and Greg, did you think this meeting was 6.30? I'm just curious, because we've been 6.15 for a while now. I sent you a message. I, I was in Boston today. I told you oh, I was in I think I remember now. I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought it was 6.30, Dan, I'll admit. <laughs> okay. Uh, 6.15 is good. I, I like that. Gets us done, you know, not too late in the evening. Any other discussion on this topic? Because first of all, our rules, unless you object, we can move this this evening. It doesn't go past the, I forget what the amount is. It's small enough um, where we don't have to wait a whole month to, to move it. Does anybody object to moving this forward to be passed this evening? I'd like to get this going. All right, then I'll, I'll, I'll take a motion if there's no more questions or discussion to approve $15,000 for historic preservation of the library. I'll make a motion to approve $15,000 for a detailed project plan for the Emily Wilson Library uh, Preservation. I second it. I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Jamie. Can I Andy. ask a quick question as to then what are the next? Well, let's wait. Get, let's get the motion done first. Oh, Jamie. sorry. <laughs> Andy. Uh, Dan. Yes. Greg. Yes. Jay. Aye. Jessica. Aye. Joe is not here. John. Yes. Harry. Aye. And Scott. Aye. Okay, so the motion passes eight uh, to zero, one absent. Uh, Elizabeth, to answer your question, you guys should be in, con you especially, or whoever you have as a committee should work with Jamie on this. Jamie's well-versed in how this works. Just so whatever the next steps are, maybe by email, she can tell you that. Okay. All right. We Great. don't need to take the time tonight because I, I think it, it may be complicated, but now that you have the funds in place, well, you don't have the funds in place, excuse me. Uh, Jamie, if we can get this uh, on the next council meeting, that would be good. Uh, I don't know if you have the time for it. Um, but, um, what happens, it's a Febru uh, February 2nd, I think. Elizabeth, that's the meeting in which it will be sent to Finance Committee. That's your next, next move. You have to come to Finance Committee, explain the historic preservation, and the full council would vote at the second meeting in February. So, Jamie, do you think that can happen? Um, I will do my best to get it on the February 2nd City Council agenda. Okay. Um, we'll I, let you know, uh, or Jamie will let you know if it does, if it succeeds. Because if it's the February 2nd uh, agenda, then it's the February uh, 9th Finance Committee meeting was when you next uh, are needed. Because all that happens on February 2nd is it is sent to committee. Okay. okay. And then you'll have the money March 1st, February, uh, the second meeting in February to begin what you need to do. In okay. the meantime, you could be in touch with Jamie to see what's going to happen after you do get the funds. Okay. Yeah, actually, I wanted to clarify that the, the funding is going to stay in the planning department or in this in the CPA account, rather. Um, and, and we'll be working uh, with the library to uh, figure out the, 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 the next the next yeah, steps. Um, most of our projects are reimbursements or or, or they're whatever, whatever. Right, this is going to be sort of run through the planning department. So it's going to be direct payment from the planning department to whichever uh, consultants that we work with or with the city solicitor, or whomever is going to be actually advising us with this process going forward. Makes sense. Okay, thank you, library people. Okay, thank We're you. We're going to move on. Thank you, CPA people. Uh, Jeff, we have a fairly large uh, document in place. Acquisition of land for new bike path connection for safe routes to city. And I imagine this money in place is to match that grant. Correct, Jeff? So to speak. Yeah, generally. We have to provide, have to provide a local, local match. So all... What we're going to do this evening is get a rundown on this. We're not voting on it. It's, it exceeds the amount of money. I think there's a great deal of information in the packet. I'm sure our members can look at it. So what I really would like you to explain, if, if you could let him be a co-host, 
Jamie, I would like him to show the map and explain the connections that we are purchasing, I imagine, or building. Oh, so take it away, Jeff. Thanks, Dan. That was a good introduction. I think um, before I share my screen, I get lost in the you know the shuffle there, the Zoom shuffle. Uh, it's safe routes to schools. So that's a it's a it's a program of Mass Mass DOT. Um, we did apply. Um, but boy, I believe it was December first. Time is flying by. I believe it's December first. We applied um, for for a huge project. So it's the the project that we applied for was one point five million dollars, and the idea um, of the project is to create um, an eight foot wide multi use path. It's called a side path um, all along Park Street. And um, it, that that construction that would be like construction costs, and that would include this piece that we we really think is critical, which would go from the rail trail. Um, which, if you've been on this section of the rail trail, you go through and you go under Park Street, this bridge. Um, but to the left of that, there's a vacant parcel, and so we did the feasibility study, which shows that you can you could bring. Um, uh, an eight to 10 foot wide accessible path up. So it would go from, from the rail trail up to Park Street. And kind of that critical connection was part of the construction costs at 1.5. Um, what it's not necessarily a match. The, the, the beauty of the Safe Routes to School program is it does not require a match, but they um, do not fund acquisition of land or relocation of utilities. And so um, this this piece that we're going to talk about tonight and, and next meeting is the acquisition of the land. Um, any costs associated with utility replacement or relocation, you know, we've had initial discussions with this, with other people in the city, and we would be trying to look at um, Chapter 90 funds uh, for that. And the way it would work is that would be mass DOT process is very long, so. We would be talking about like Chapter 90 funds in 2024 because uh, they're kind of slated up for the next year or two. But in 2024, and talking with the director of DPW and the mayor, like that would be potentially feasible. So the total project cost for utility re relocation was estimated to be like 300,000. So on top of the 1.5 million, we're at 1.8 million. And again, it doesn't include acquisition. So, um, it's kind of a big topic that we're talking about now, but um, the uh, we have an appraisal, um, which I realize is not in your packet because the appraiser, um, the appraising company um, gave me the verbal um, dollar figure that they came up with, which was 110,000 um, uh, for the land. And I'll put up a map in a second. Um, but the appraisal, I just, I've been kind of hounding them and they haven't given it to me yet. So, you know, with that, with, with, with just that aside, we, we want to go to the next meeting, but we it was in communication with them and they, they knew the dollar figure that they were going to have in there. And I think it was just putting their, together the rest of the document has not come forward yet. You're uh, confident that that 110,000 is accurate or will be, yeah. will we be seeing a new application, which is all right. We can, as long as it's in the neighborhood. No, I was assured that the number was set at, uh, the acquisition cost was 110. And then I did, you know, I have a, I have an estimate from a local surveying company that they would need to create, you know, an A and R um, plan to par to, car to parcel it off. Um, we would have closing costs and things like that. So that the total request for CPA right now is one hundred and thirty seven thousand five hundred, and that's all in the packet. Um, so now, if I could just show the map first, if that's okay. Um, um, this is just the sort of the simple GIS map, but. Where we are is um, uh, the rail trails highlighted in red right here. And you can see this area where Park Street, where the rail trail kind of currently goes under. But what we're talking about is a piece, um, a, a not a, it's a part of um, this lot here shown as 117. Um, this is currently Phillips Manufacturing. And the area that we're talking about is um, the left side of this parcel. Um, it necks down and narrows down towards Park Street and comes over. The idea is that we would leave, you know, the required setback off of this building, which is like 30 feet. Um, and when you do that, you you create what is a actual building lot. So it meets frontage and depth requirements. So 
know, we are talking about a, a piece of real estate that has has some value to them. That's why it's up at one hundred and ten thousand. But we, um, I, well, I and in, in, in consultation with the mayor, I've had con- conversations with the owners and the operators of Mint Phillips, and they're they're very willing to talk to us about this. Um, when I went over there, um, they were interested in trying to be supportive of the city's efforts to do this. And um, just a quick sidebar is that they um, build metal uh, metal hollow doors um, for things like schools and larger um, buildings and you know bigger projects. And they actually are building all the doors for the new school. Um, so within that little shop in East Hampton, they've been around for a long time, and they they pump out tons of metal doors for. Um, places all across the whole country and so he gave me he quick gave me a tour it was really fascinating but anyway very nice gentleman named russ um so then kind of to go show another map um part of what we're trying to do is um create this area here on ward ave this is really the one of the key connections that this property would provide um and it would lead um up the side the, the the side path would go up the side of Park Street. Um, um, here's um, Garfield, Bryant, Taft Ave, and then it would um, come down to, sorry, a little farther, to the entrance where, the, where you know, everyone now is hopefully driven through the roundabout. So at the top of the roundabout, this eight foot wide path would connect with the 10 foot wide path that was constructed as part of the school. And it would create this um, sort of safe uh, route for for walkers and bikers to get to the new school. So in early, I, I'm almost done, but to get to early conversations with MassDOT and the Safe Routes program, um, we've we've become actively engaged. I wanna give Scott credit and Lori Garcia, who's a school committee member, um, activating the um, walk, bike and roll um, is part of, you know, that's part of the requisite things that we need to be doing to qualify for Safe Routes. So we've been doing that um, we did our the city. We did our first bike rodeo uh, over the summer, um, and they did a walk audit um, as part. Of, those are all things that are um, you know required to even get the application in. And in talking to them, what we looked at was this connector here. Um, if we can make this happen, and then you look at the the rail trail, the way it crosses the whole city, we can in theory create a safe route for. Um, students who live in like the new city area or the pleasant green area by the mills we have a larger concentration of people who live there and they can get on the bike path then traverse this way which is pretty safe then um, using this connector piece then traverse the eight foot wide path to the new school and so mass cot was um, very encouraging of that um, we roughly calculated that it would it would create a, a safer route for about 350 students um, who live on that side of town. Um, there's another pocket of people who live kind of over by South Street. So those people would take South Street, you know, to the school. But um, even this route with the with the rail trail opens up opportunity for people who live off of Holyoke Street. Um, if they can, you know, they'd have to make it down Cottage Street. Um, which they which they currently do to get to like Center of Pepin, and then they can connect to the bike path. And so we're opening up this 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 one parcel gives us the opportunity to connect those students to the new school. Um, so um, going through this is the feasibility study. We did look at another route um, that goes on the other side of Phillips Man- Phillips Manufacturing, and then up. This is Hisgin Avenue in yellow. Um, and around kind of in Daly Field and into Nonantuck. And the, the the conversation we're having is if Mass DOT says no to our safe routes to school um, application and they say that this will never work, um, then we may revert back to this other, um, you know, this other path. But for the time being, we're trying to just, you know, move kind of inch forward with this parcel um, that show, is shown in yellow here. And then... Uh, just one last little set of images. I'm just curious. Uh, I know we're just talking about. Uh, uh, could you stop at that right there? Oh, oh, go back. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I just got to the page I wanted. That's um, the rail trail. I'm sorry. You said that the, the, what we're going to do is expand. It sounds like the sidewalk. That was it right there to an eight foot wide path. Yeah. 
So all along Park Street, along that side of the street, in the right of way, so we're not having to take any property. We don't want to do that again, Jeff. <laughs> uh, if we could get a path like this mm -hmm. on Park Street, that would make it incredibly great. And I, I'm wondering, in your look at Park Street, are we talking about taking down trees, moving a lot of poles? I'm just curious. I know that's not what's part of this discussion. But yeah, no, it, it is, that, Dan. That I mean, it seems to me to be a great idea. It's definitely part of the bigger conversation. So um, there is. So this section is from uh, Ward Ave to Garfield, and so this has actually the most constraints due to utility poles. So I believe it's this one. I think it's in that section. There are. Let's see. Yeah, in that section I just had, there are six utility poles that um, are on this, are on the on the side path side of the street. So in terms of utilities, this was the worst section. And the general notion was to take the six utility poles and move them to the other side of the street. And it's not cheap to do that, but that would open up this path here. Um, yeah, the, the, the route through Park Street has some constraints for sure. And so... Um, the idea here, this is looking towards the school. Um, there's this row of trees, and the, the concept is to, to put the to side path around both sides and try to preserve those trees. Um, and then kind of working up so you can see um, we have cross sections for all of this. This is that section right here where can, the concept is to go around those trees to preserve them. Uh, then there's, you know, all throughout there's some issues, but then this area here, these are larger um, existing trees. And so the idea is to go on the inside of them and save the trees. But the goal was to save trees, at least in this first initial pass at the plan. And then down here, so you can see the path jogs in. So there are some areas that we do encroach on private property, but I would say it's nothing of the scale that we're dealing with Union Street. I mean, Union Street, we're affecting um, 20, 20, 29 properties, I think it is. And here, the estimate is that like four, four or five, we have to talk about, you know, possible um, borrowing some land, taking some land. Um, and then the rest of it kind of goes in along Park Street. This area, this picture on the bottom is the last area of some constraints. So the, the larger trees on the left um, would require the road, the road would get reconfigured a little bit. But I think anecdotally, what we've seen so far is that people are really driving too fast, kind of coming and going out of the roundabout. So this would serve as some traffic calming. So there's nothing about this that um, is a small project. And we need to you know hear from MassDOT as to their willingness to either, either fund it um, or give us comments back. But in the meantime, there's some, you know, there's some need for us to kind of inch this part along. Um, gosh, I realize I know I'm talking a lot. I think the thing that we're looking for tonight is questions and just a general sense. Um, come back at the next meeting. And you know, what I what I'm really looking to do is understand CPA's position. Um, then we would continue to talk further with the property owner and probably craft a uh, an option to purchase agreement that we would, so with the CPA kind of behind this, then I can go and start to talk to the owner with this offer agreement. And then we go to full city council at some point um, to show that we have all the funds necessary to acquire this. Um, I saw, I, okay. Yep. So I think I'll pause for questions at this point. Um, I have a couple. Number one, uh, the purchase agreement would be something you would put in place, but you do want the funds in place, or do you just want a, the CPA at the next meeting to say, yes, we are interested, but not to actually do an appropriation until you're, you get the DOT money? I'm, I'm, not, I'm unclear on what your process is here. Yeah, so it would... I think it would be similar to what we've done, what we did with Reservation Road, which was the most recent acquisition, which is we need to understand that CPA is supportive. Um, so at your next meeting, let's say in February, you vote to recommend the funding. Um, 
I would put together the, we would, we, the city would put together the offer agreement and the appropriation request and move that to city council. And I think there's really two discussion pieces at that point, which is, do we just try to acquire this no matter what? Um, because if you look at the permanent nature of the school, we just funded, you know, the giant, the biggest projects of our history. And this piece is just going to be critical regardless of whether we get this safe route to school grant or, you know, if I, you know, get run over by a bus, the next person behind me will want to have access to this parcel or do we just make it contingent upon the safe routes? You know, so that's kind of a little policy question that we need to tackle as a group, but well, personally, and I'll let the, this is my last thing I was going to say, uh, purchasing this property and actually constructing that rail trail extension to Park Street, whether we get the rest of the money to do the, the project that's great, to me, seems like a, a very good idea. We might as well do that part, even if we don't get the DOT funding. But that's just my, my feeling right now. Mm -hmm. uh, if I hear you right, if the CPA says yes to this, you go out, you tell the DOT, CPA's on board, you talk to the owners, et cetera, but we're not going to appropriate any funds until you get word back from DOT one way or the other. And then we can make the decision whether or not we want to build this section, even if we don't get the DOT funds for this particular path. Am I correct in that? Yeah. I, it's That's a new, future it, discussion. It's nuanced a little bit, right? So, I mean... What I'm worried about, to be perfectly candid with the group, is like I don't know exactly when Safe Routes to School will inform us of anything, but if they come back in, let's say they come back in mid-February and say you've been awarded this grant, um, we're gonna we're gonna need to be like queued up and ready to have um, you know have possession of this property, and so we'll already kind of be a little bit behind that, but. Um, that's one of the nuances that I have not worked through yet because we're we're in this waiting game with with knowing the fate of safe routes. I think to your bigger point was we could continue to pursue other grant funding sources to build the path. Um, so there's programs like Mass Trails. You know, the last program they said that what they want to fund is the critical connections, the the last piece of puzzles. Because I think what Mass Trails wants to do is come in and say, we finished this, like we helped finish this project. And so there's kind of a compelling story there too that we could, if we owned it, then we could pursue the funds to build it. All right. Uh, Scott. All right. Uh, first, excuse me. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Jeff for all his work on this project. This is a huge project that has been going on for a long time. Um, and I know how many hours he spent on this and I just want to say how much I appreciate it. So thank you for all of your work on that, Jeff. Um, the other piece that I really think is important to understand with this is what Jeff said about how this piece is going to be important no matter what. So I would advocate for, for the CPA, um, working to acquire this piece and build, like I'd advocate for the city wanting to build this one piece this connection from the bike path at Ward Avenue up to the sidewalk, no matter what. Because it's that, right now- Is that kind of a footpath now anyways, or are people cut? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Can we wait until I call on you, please? Sure. Scott, finish your statement. Sure. So so right now there there is, you know, that land is is vacant and weedy, and there's like a little footpath. People cut up it now because- it's such a logical connection to want to go from the bike path up to Park Street where there's a sidewalk. As a teacher, I see students ride that every day. Um, even in the winter, we still have some students riding. Uh, but especially before it got, it got colder, we got a lot of students riding now. Um, and I think this would really uh, you know, keep them safe, encourage, encourage more riding. But more, more than anything, like walking, this is a, this is a way people want to go. And even this little piece is super valuable in opening up any potential connections later on. So I just want to, while I, I really appreciate all of Jeff's work for this larger project, um, be, uh, because this, this request is for this smaller one, I want to make sure we understand the, the criticalness of, the, of this part of it, even without everything else. Harry, I'll get to you after I saw Andy, then John, then you, Harry. Andy. 
Okay, I got a couple of quick ones. Would the would the extension onto Park Street would that like basically be adjacent to the existing sidewalk, or would that take up the existing sidewalk on Park Street? You mean? Yes. It would. It would. Uh, I forgot what you just said. Uh, it would. It would take over. It would eliminate the existing sidewalk and make the make it wider, generally in the location of where it is now. Okay. Okay. But there's a lot of grading. There's a lot of changes that would have to happen right. to make it eight feet wide. And the DOT standard is, well, that we shot for was eight feet wide plus two feet of shoulder mm -hmm. on each side. And so that that takes it to you know, 12 feet, whereas right now it's kind of like a three and a half foot wide cement walk most of the way. But, it, but the cement walk would basically be gone and this would be in place of it. Exactly, yes. Okay. Yeah. The other question I have is you were talking about the new city kids. Don't they already take the bus to school? And if they were going to Whitebrook, aren't they already taking a bus to Whitebrook? Um, you know, I think that's probably true. Um, I think what the idea is to offer alternative modes of transportation. I have no idea what it's like to ride a bus from New City, but um, I think that riding a bike or even walking would probably be quicker, uh, depending on the route. So if that's a question you have, I can we can figure it out. But yeah, I, I would assume that you are eligible for the bus at that distance, but um, to be stuck with the bus being your only mode, you know, that's kind of what Safe Routes is looking to promote is any alternatives that would help students have options. And just remembering that we're going from what used to be a five to eight to now K through eight. So you're, you're, you're largely, you're really increasing the number of students who are going to be getting at school. And, um, I have heard anecdotally that school buses are we're not we're not a uh, we're not flush with school buses either. So that is a problem that we have not really um, as a community solved the additional need for more buses to get farther. But okay. that's a, I'm a little bit uh, speaking out of turn on some of that. So if that's a if that's a factor, I can definitely talk to the school department a little bit more to get some detail. Um, I'm going to go to John. You still have a question, John? Uh, well, some of it got answered in that I had originally wondered myself about the utility of the access, regardless of the connection to the school. And it sounds like that's that's exactly what we would want is, regardless of the larger project, that's an access that everyone uses. And I guess I'll point out that, um, as I recall, the master plan reflected the town's desire to create those specifically those type of connections. So first of all, just support for the larger plan. That's that's exactly the kind of thing we want to do. But <clears throat> I guess I'll throw in last thing first, because I'm reminded by what you were just saying, Jeff, that uh, living on Maple Street, one of the things I've heard discussed and one of the things that makes part of our community is people enjoy walking their kids to school. People enjoy seeing the kids walking to school. There, there are people who make it part of their routine. They do their dog walk. It's, it's part of a whole environment of activity and culture that is one of the things I've heard people specifically mention they were concerned about losing when, for example, the schools uh, were being discussed. So here's an opportunity to recreate that. I, I want to throw out, maybe most importantly, I think I, I want to point out that you talk about sort of, um, if I can paraphrase here, a, a, a camaraderie, a good, good sense of um, um, this business is already in a situation where they're working with the town in such a way that it sounds to me like we have an opportunity to create a good rapport and that may not always be there other people may own that space or in the future things could change and right now you have people who feel good about the connection there's other connections with the school i think if as is our want the cpa really touts what happened and makes clear to people like hey this is how your tax money is spent and look at the good things that are created um, i think that's an opportunity we shouldn't miss uh, and time is not on our side uh, i guess the other stuff can mostly wait i just again i i just kind of want to emphasize that when i google earth it uh, 
You know, I can see, um, for one thing, a lot of people already walking on the sidewalk on the other side. One is, I guess I would recommend for the larger project, you, you've got a community there, and if they can be involved and have, have a sense of ownership of some of the, you know, here's how we use it. I mean, there is a sidewalk on the other side, and I did immediately wonder why you were on the side with the utility poles, but again, you answered that question. So I guess generally otherwise my support for this. And I think I had Barry, myself. you still have a question, sir? Yeah, who's going to maintain this thing and uh, get it all built? Who's going to plot it? Who's going to plot this? That's the question. That's the question we always get. I think, you know, generally speaking, what we're talking about is kind of a split venture. Um, DPW, um, the way the just, I, I, you know, I'm still learning things too. Actually, every day I learn something. Uh, but DPW has a list of sidewalks that they maintain. Um, they pay a subcontractor to go out, you know, like X number of hours after a storm. So we would be talking about, you know, a, a modest increase in the budget of that, that line item for, for subcontractors to plow. The conversation that we had kind of loosely was maybe it could be split halfway um, DPW goes up to a point on Park Street and then the school department, which has equipment and is already going to be plowing their 10 foot wide multi-use path all the way up to the top and plow the roundabout that if they went a little bit further, um, you know, that that's the idea of how it would get covered. I, Harry, I think those are always good questions. I think, um, it's a, it's always a chicken and egg kind of scenario with, with maintenance, um, you know, this idea of acquiring is really critical, but then building it, you know, we don't know if we're, if we're ready to build it yet. So the maintenance would have to come along with those discussions, but it's, it's totally a fair question. So hopefully I gave you a shot at kind of some of the early discussions that we've had about how to do that. Well, I can't imagine walking from a uh, new city down by the bypass up to that, up to that school when it's like uh, 10 or 15 degrees all the side, that'd be uh kind of pushing it, you know? Uh, I'm old enough to tell you that in my community, I had to do it. So it does happen, uh, Harry. Greg, you have your hand up, sir. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think this is a great idea. Uh, <laughs> so I'm hugely in favor of it. Um, you know, we decided to move these, you know, schools uh, out of downtown and put them out park. Um, and a project like this could easily have been a condition of doing that. I mean, like we, in some ways, um, creating connections to this, uh, what is now like the education hub of East Hampton makes complete sense. Um, and I, I, so I just, I'm in support of it in concept. Um, I also will, will um, second what Scott was saying about the extension being a standalone. Uh, I mean, I've climbed that hill multiple times from the bike path. I know there's a well-trod uh, pedestrian path kind of leading up that hill. It's like an intuitive and natural cut through um, and People are looking to connect to the bike path and people are looking to connect to park right at that intersection. It's confounded me since I moved to East Hampton and the bike path has been there. Like how to, you know, why isn't there a connection here? And it's a little bit easier. Um, so I think we should pursue it independently of um, a larger project, but I do think the larger project makes a ton of sense because we as a community decided to move the bulk of our students um, out park. Um, and I do believe it creates options, even fair weather options. Um, you know, I don't see a lot of people <clears throat> biking from new city in, you know, 10 degree weather, but you know, some people have activities or some people want to get to white Brook for games or other kinds of things that are not related to bus, like school bus activities. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, and then I have a couple questions. And I don't fully understand. You know, I'm not a zoning person, so I don't know what's considered a sidewalk. If there are the like, like strict definitions for these things, um, I know if you have a sidewalk in front of your residential home, you're kind of responsible for mm -hmm. keeping it clear. Yes, okay. So this changes it a little bit, is my understanding. So I guess I have two questions. You know, is this at any point kind of a bike lane? Is it like literally 
asphalt adjacent to park um, along that stretch? Is it sort of quasi bike lane um, or is it always separated by some green? That's one of my questions. And then, um, yeah. And then where does it fall from like a zoning standpoint, as far as categorization, if it's not a sidewalk um, and what does that mean? I think that's, that's it. Those are great questions. I mean, I think, um, yeah, you're on to something with the, the way the ordinance, so that's the city ordinance that says that you as a homeowner, proper even business owner would be responsible for clearing that section in front of you. Um, so we, moving forward in big picture, we'd probably want to talk about amending that so that, you know, it, it is clear more clearly the responsibility of X, Y, or Z, so DPW or school department or someone else, because I think that that would be something we would certainly hear about if we, you know, if, for example, we're awarded the Safe Ross School funding, I think that that would be a really common reaction for the, for the, you know, what I, I don't know the exact number, it's in the report, 19 driveways, 19 homeowners, so that would be really important to start tackling um, if we're awarded the larger project. Um, it is supposed to be separated. So this is not, um, it's not like road and eight feet, like on the same plane. So one of the highest criteria of safe routes is to separate it. So whether it's a, and some, in some places we're higher and, or, or some places we're higher than the road, um, in places where it's close, the, the, the standard is two feet of separation. And because we're kind of con con constrained and if there is a place where it's closer, we're talking about some kind of separator, like a split rail fence or something. And when we were doing the feasibility study, we talked about just so everyone's kind of on the same page that it's not, it's not a separator to, to prevent a car. It's just, a, it's a separate, it's like a visual delineator of some sort. So I, I think it's important just because we're not talking about a guardrail. Uh, but we're talking about something that um, is a barrier. Um, and that is, if you look carefully through the plans, it, it kind of shows where that is a constraint. Um, we are working in not perfect conditions where Park Street is not the widest right of way we have in the city. So we are a little bit of a square peg in a round hole to kind of get us on Park Street. And one of the reasons why we, we kind of abandoned the Nonatuck route um, first, because it was going to be more expensive, um, but also because you're going to, you're going to be routing away from, you know, highly traveled roads, which is something that we're, you know, you kind of weigh those two things in terms of the route. Okay. Uh, I just, just to remind everybody, the CPA's portion of this is to purchase the land. And I started us off by asking about what the safe roads project is, because ultimately I hope this is the direction we go where we do connect to the bike path and there is a safe route to school right up Park Street. But it's two separate discussions. Uh, Jessica. Um, yep, just a couple of uh, things to add. Um, that, yes, I'm, I'm in support of this. I think to reiterate what others have said, it has been a cut through. I've seen it as a cut through. I think there's liability issues with people crossing private property um, on an industrial piece of land. I've seen people come a little bit too close to trucks and stuff. So I, this is makes me feel better knowing there'd be a safer access point to the bike path at this location. Um, I'm thrilled with the idea of a safe route to school down Park Street. I hope that the city would consider expanding it even farther down to the Plains at some point. I see a number of kids from the Plains neighborhood that bike um, and uh, use the sidewalk to, to feel safe. It is a very busy road. So I'm hoping that at some point that is a, a future plan to connect down to the Plains. There's a lot of kids who live down here too that will be going to the schools. So um, not just New City, although I used to live in New City before I moved to the Plains. So I can appreciate the neighborhood connection there too. Um, as for the option agreement, I guess this is where I'm a little bit confused in terms of why wait. If this is a piece that is a priority and it sounds like everybody's in consensus about how important this piece is as a connector, um, why wait getting a signed option agreement with the landowner with a modest deposit down of like $1,000 in good faith, giving you six months to, to, 
to wait for the grant to come in or whatever, to be able to do your due diligence without um, by having that right to get onto their property and to do that work, um, rather than wait until you hear until all these other things come through. So I guess that's just my question on why wait and getting the option signed between the city and the landowner. Um, I think you would want that in place in case, like you said, anything can happen. You know, something could happen to the landowner and, and a verbal A-OK is not going to, you know, help you move forward. So. Yeah, uh, I want to try, try to tackle that one first. So, you know, I think the I, I, it's the second time I said it and I apologize for using the chicken and egg analogy again. It's the best I got tonight. I'm tired. It's been it's been a long week. Um, we so I could in, we could in theory talk to the landowner and ask them to sign it. Right. But on our end, we have nothing. We so this meeting is the first public discussion of this. Um, next meeting, I hope that the CPA would vote to recommend the funding. But still, then I have nothing like I don't have, we have no money uh, attached to that offer on our side. Um, so the the pattern I and Jess, this is good, but the pattern I've been trying to do is like come to the CPA because you guys are great and we always talk about the leveraging the funds. Um, I think what I really need is I, I think and really we, we need to go all the way to city council before we can before we can like assure the property owner that we can hold up our side, which is the appraisal side. Um, and then even to sign the option agreement on the city side, we need to go to city council. So um, it's a, it's like a land transaction so that we've, we've, I've learned that we need to go to city council for that. So the pattern that has worked a little bit is to take these extra steps early with CPA um, go and, and make sure that CPA is supportive of the funds and just move the two together. Um, the option agreement signing, well, actually, I think it would be the appropriation first, then the option signing in the same meeting. And so um, I appreciate that. Um, I've been talking to the landowner and they're great. And I, I, you know, he's like, well, what do you think? And I say, well, I think I need to kind of make sure that people are <laughs> behind this. What about um, like a memorandum of understanding or something? Something that's that, you know, may, maybe it's not an option. I just know in our world, we, we sign options with property owners all the time with the ability to walk away at any moment if something falls through. So, you know, that those are the options that, that our language is crafted, that it gives us the right to do due diligence. We can walk away if we hit bad soils, if the appraisal comes in some wackadoodle number, like there's provisions that give us an out. And maybe that maybe that doesn't work because it's municipal, so it's like a whole different ballgame. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, just to give you an idea that we do, you know, when we, we, we do options and we, we set provisions that give us an out, but mm -hmm. I think maybe because it's a whole city council process that just overcomplicates it, but well, maybe yeah, a but... memorandum of understanding or something, you know, just to sort of, I guess I would, as a CPA committee member, I would have a hard time uh, voting to approve, to release money for an acquisition without some signed option or something. Well, I, I'm yeah. going to say, I'll get to you in a minute, Jamie. I'm just going to say that I'd like to see this appropriation move forward. I'm hearing from this committee that regardless of the Safe Routes grant, this connection is valuable to the city. And if purchasing this property sooner rather than later um, is an option, why don't we get this done next meeting so it can go right to city council? I know that may not be what you thought would be the process, but in my view, just hearing everybody and hearing how much it's already been used, let's purchase this property. And then if we don't get the DOT money, we pursue other grants to get the connection built. But if we're, we're talking about purchasing property, and as Jessica just said, I think these guys would be willing to give us a memorandum of understanding. You don't have to throw money at it because you can't. You have to wait for the city council to approve it. But I think they're very they're very amenable to that. Um, I'd hate to see us, as uh, I think John said, I hate to see us lose this opportunity. We we need to move quickly. So I'm going to say that the next meeting, let's discuss purchasing this property and moving an appropriation forward. Uh, I'm in favor of that, and I hope I, I'd like to see nods of people that. Is everybody okay with that? Because I, I think yeah, I guess my regardless. other thing too is it, my other thing too is if you wait too long and the appraisal number changes, then what? Like yeah. you know, the market is so wackadoodle right now that 
you know, what happens if that number changes? Yeah, I appreciate this. I mean, this is good because I, without even a vote, just knowing that the committee is kind of behind the approach, what I would what what I would do is in the, in between this meeting and your next one, is we would work out with the city attorney. We would come up with that option agreement language, and I would have that ready for your next meeting so you can see it. And, and then, so Jess, that's the one thing I'm I like. The our worst flaw is that we are slow. Um, okay. This is fast enough. I I, I do want to say I, I've kind of laid out like a long. This isn't like. I think this is normal. I, I anticipated the second meeting um, with Jamie's help, right? So after the second meeting, um, we would queue it up for the first meeting of March um, with city council subcommittee. And so by mid-March, like we would be in the place where we have this. So like what the city attorney is telling me is I, I cannot, we can't even, we can't even sign an MOA because that has to do with the exchange of real property until we have city council authorizing the mayor to do that. So at the same time, we would have that funding appropriation together with it. And that just, um, that's exactly, I think that's what you're talking about, Jess, but I think that's the process that I've been told we have to kind that's of- That's fine. Through. Just throwing it out there is trying to help you out. That's all. I appreciate that. I understand uh, the municipal process let's takes see, time. I Andy, get it. Is your, <laughs> Andy, did you have a question again? Uh, no, you muted yourself, Andy. And you muted yourself. <laughs> How big is that parcel? Um, yeah, that's where I wish oh, the, the parcel overall, roughly through two and a half acres. And then the, what we're looking at is uh, about an acre. Um, that I really, I apologize because I was supposed to, I was told I would have the appraisal for way before this meeting tonight. Um, so I would imagine that in, a, in that appraisal, they'll highlight the area that we're talking about and give it a size. Um, but we did talk about an acre because um, I believe, uh, I have not memorized the zoning, but I believe that in the industrial district, it's 40,000 square feet for a lot. So that was, you know, we also wanted to make sure we give these people a legit, like, real offer so that we're, we're competitive with, um, you know, other people, abutters, other abutting property owners uh, who may also want this property. We, we want to be competitive. So in theory, though, it's, since it's zoned business, it's the guy that owns it right now would expand into it or someone would decide they wanted to put a business there? That's the, the comp, I'm just the competition for that parcel would be that, right? Yeah, or a budding large um, sprawling property owners nearby. Um, okay. I get it. Thank you. Could also want that. Um. Yeah, that is always the thing. Now, Jamie, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. So I just wanted to um, remind everyone that um, purchase of real property with CPA funds requires a uh, preservation restriction for open space as part of the process. And I, I'm not sure whether or not that was included in the budget or your to-do list for this, Jeff, but that would be a requirement under the CPA law. Okay. And I don't think that, I don't think that's a problem. Uh, I don't know if it costs any money to make it a preserved open space preservation, but we would, we would just um, need to find a, a willing, we can't own the property and the restriction. So we'd have to find a land trust to take that, uh, to, to hold that restriction on behalf of the city. More work for you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> just what I need. Uh, <laughs> The one question that that raises, if, I, if you don't mind, I, I'm sorry, but to, not to belabor this. Um, when, so the preservation restriction, would when would that be required? Would that be like prior to the final acquisition? Would that need to be recorded and in, in place and recorded at that same time? That, that may be the only thing I'm thinking about. It would be hard. I think it technically happens the moment that the city takes ownership of it we cannot own the property and the restriction. So, so, so prior the, to the, closing. The, the, at the closing, um, it happens. The, the, no. the, I don't, I don't recall how it worked with the other uh, properties, but, but what, what was happened at um, the East street for the um, mm -hmm. Mount Tom North would be the same type of process. But isn't this recreation not open space? So, what what's the restriction on the bike path itself? Because to me, this is just an extension of the bike path. It's like an it's like a you know a connector. 
right. So I, I, I want to cut that discussion off. I think Jamie and uh, Jessica, great, great point. Uh, Jamie and Jeff, you, you, you kind of have offices next to each other. Let's work this out. If we can get around that, okay, but I don't think there's a land trust that wouldn't help us out. They're not being asked to provide any funds. Yeah. Um, but JB brings up a good point. If we can get around the preservation, open space preservation, because it's recreational, I mean, I don't know what we had to do to build the bike path, but that was recreational. And did we have to preserve the space next to it? Who knows? No, it's fine. Um, it's, I don't want to really get good. into that now, but because I want to conclude this meeting with an ask of the committee are you in favor of pursuing this purchase regardless of the safe routes to school grant i am i'd like to see that connector is anybody opposed to that right now because i would like the next meeting to concentrate on actually getting an appropriation forward to city council with all of the documentation regarding um the purchase of real property, preservation if we need it, as Jamie said, all of that ready to go. You've got a month. Mm -hmm. But to me, um, the other thing is this comes out, maybe the next door neighbor wants the property. That, that's a scary thing. I mean, it could happen. And then the price goes up. Uh, Phillips is on our side, though. So I, uh, it's Phillips, right? Phillips Manufacturing. Yep. So that's, that's, that's what I'd like to do. And I, see, I don't see any objection to that from the committee. So why don't we pursue that, Jeff, OK? Yeah, that's great. I appreciate. Yep, I, I, yep, I appreciate that a lot. I think it's perfect, and it just gives me, you know, enough to go and spend the, <laughs> spend the time to set all that up. The one thing I'll just quick say is that the preservation restriction and that kind of thing that's, will that's what the option agreement will do. So like, we will create an option agreement that gives us, you know, six months to close, and that would be the window when we can do that. So I don't need to rush and panic on the preservation restriction, but I'll focus on the offer, the offer agreement um, with the city attorney. And that's this is perfect. It's good guidance. Okay, but I think the committee is giving you marching orders to let's purchase this land. Um, the safe routes to school, DOT, they they may come up and say no, um, and then maybe you have to pursue other. Well, we can't fund a million dollars to build a this connector i don't know how much it would cost but if let's hope the dot is on board um but in any case we get the land then we can move forward right yeah the connector would not it would not be a million dollars and and the one last thing I, I don't need to say this but so i should learn my lesson but i there was something that uh maybe john or greg said like you've you've taken that little path but like i have a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old um, and they cannot get their bikes up that. It's like yeah, covered up. It's, it's terrible. It, it's not accessible. Someone with mobility issues would not get up there. Like it, so to say like everybody uses it is actually like not true because like we're excluding a lot of people from using it because it's super rough. If it's wet, slippery, fall. So the idea is to make it accessible and like the, the feasibility study said you can do it at the accessible 5% grade. So we would be creating like the opportunity for everyone to do that. So that's just one last thing that was- uh, Another to reason to pursue yeah. the purchase. Yeah. Great. All right, is so your... I don't think there's anything else to discuss this evening, but I wanna concentrate next meeting on purchase of the property and the appropriation. We don't need to get into the safe routes thing. If you get the grant, great. But the CPA's part right now is to purchase this property. Am I correct? That's the only thing that's on our plate. Correct, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's great because this is a this is a permanent attempt to, you know, we're gonna be dealing with that school. I think Greg said, like we're gonna we have and what Jessica said is connecting from the planes. I mean, we have like years of projects to kind of reorient our whole city towards that new school. So this is kind of the, this preserves this little parcel for us to do that. So it's great. And I, I, I want to say, Jess, I just thought of it. I was driving from my son's house and I noticed two kids coming up uh, Strong Street walking to, and we need to change. I think it was Greg. It's not Whitebrook anymore, Greg. It's Mountain View. <laughs> they're walking to Mountain View school and they're walking in the road because there's no sidewalks on strong all the way up until they get to park street so jessica's point i'm the rep, rep from that area is perfect so i know that's the future but that's also a bunch of kids living on that side of the of town 
Anyway. It's not just connecting to the school. It's connecting to downtown. I mean, my family, we would bike to downtown if it felt safe. In order for me to get downtown, I have to like go cut up through to connect to South Street. So, you know, this area needs some needs some love in terms of uh, bike ped friendly. There you go. All right. If, if, if only Scott Cavanaugh lived in my district, it'd be all, we'll be all set. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So anything else from the committee this evening? Uh, I do hope you all can make it to the next meeting because you all are well versed on this now and we can make it have a vote on this. If not, then I'll have a motion to adjourn, please. Oh wait, Jeff, you have the right, so do you have the do you have the next meeting date set or is it February seventeenth? That's right. Okay, I just want to make sure. Six fifteen yep. there, Mr. Greg. <laughs> All right. Six fifteen, February seventeenth. Sorry about that, Dan. That's okay. Greg. I have to have I have to have dinner sometime. I just thought it was six thirty. Well, we tried you would have, try you would have seen me doing this for the first, you know, for ten or fifteen minutes. There are counselors on our council zooms doing that so don't worry about it it's it's precedent's been set uh okay can i have a jay, motion make adjourn? the motion jay make the motion <laughs> second motion to adjourn jamie ben yes jay all right scott all right harry all right sean andrew Sorry. hi yes please greg hi and Jessica. Aye. Thank you all. And, and thank you for continuing to support me as your chair. I enjoy it. So thank you very much. We're glad you're back, Dan. Um, I'm happy to be back. We'd be all floundering right. without you. Floundering. Right. <laughs> I don't Good work, that. everybody. Right. Have a nice Thanks, evening, everybody. everybody. Bye. Thank you.